So. And so it is with both professional pride and personal admiration that I welcome to the Great Lives podium my one-time student and full-time friend, Joanna Catron. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Bill, for inviting me to join uh, this distinguished roster of speakers. I'm very honored. And good evening to all of you. Thank you for honoring me with your presence. OK, here we go. In the art world of 1890, American painters James McNeil Whistler at the left and John Singer Sargent were undisputed rock stars. But for a while, they shared the stage with Gary Melchers, and he was no backup band. He was at the top of his game with studios in Paris, Holland, and New York. In 1889, Melchers and Sargent shared the grand prize for American painting at the Paris Universal Exposition. That's the fair where the Eiffel Tower made its debut. And together with Whistler, these were the three most prominent Americans to make their careers abroad. Born in Detroit in 1860, Melchers barely finished his training before he was singled out by the art establishment as an up-and-comer. Undisturbed by poverty or parental objections or even the lurid tales of the bohemian life that often dog other artists. I'm sorry, you're probably wanting to hear some good poop tonight. Well, not, not there. This painting helped him to gain his first critical success with a series of monumental compositions depicting the Dutch working class. This is the sermon painted when he was 19, 20, when he was 26 years old, and it is owned by the Smithsonian today. Melcher's reputation would steadily grow. He earned prizes that eluded most others, was never without work, and was very well compensated for it. A prolific painter, he participated in over a hundred exhibitions and fairs. His pictures graced the walls of museums both here and abroad and the covers of national and regional magazines. Despite all of that, over, th over the course of 80 years since his death, Melchers has been largely forgotten, consigned to the margins of the American art canon. Art is like fashion. It follows trends. Today, Gary Melchers does not have the name recognition of a whistler or a sergeant. And he attracts only a narrow niche of scholars and collectors. In fact, Melchers is rarely included in general surveys on American art. And an artist's failure to endure can also uh, be affected by artistic succession. In other words, Melchers had no disciples or followers of note. Consequently, he's regarded today as a second-tier artist. In effect, he painted enough memorable pictures to secure him an important place in the pantheon of American painters. It's just that his body of work is no longer in the mainstream. And don't mistake market value as a reliable indicator on how well a rec an artist is recognized. Typically, Melcher's best pictures, about a dozen or so, are valued between $100,000 and $300,000 each. And those are pretty impressive figures for a forgotten artist. Philanthropist and arts patron Alice Walton, daughter of Walmart founder, Sam Walton paid $938,000 for this picture in 2004. It's called The Embroideress, and that wildly inflated price had um, much to do with the um, owners, the past owners. They were preeminent collectors of American art, Daniel and Rita Fraud. 
Today, the embroideress occupies a place of honor in the institution Walton spearheaded, the Crystal Bridges Museum in Bentonville, Arkansas. This blue chip painting doesn't change a thing. The star power of Gary Melcher's name has dimmed considerably. It, naturally, it would distress Melcher's to learn that he is no longer well recognized. To hear himself featured in essays titled The Forgotten Episode and Return from Oblivion. The unfamiliarity of his name perplexes our visitors today at Belmont, the artist's home and studio that memorializes his career. Why have we not heard of him before, they frequently ask. This is the artist's widow in his studio at Belmont. The artist's widow has been blamed for her husband's disappearing act, that she took everything off the market and hoarded it at Belmont. But following his death, the truth is that she had everything returned. I'm getting a backache. <laughs> there we go. She had everything returned so that it could be inventoried and reevaluated in preparation for traveling exhibitions that were mounted throughout the 1930s. And she got his work back on the market right away. No, there's another explanation for the ebbing of Melcher's career. The work of Gary Melcher's had fallen out of step with prevailing tastes. This is his painting, The Open Door, at Belmont. 1900 was marked by political and cultural upheaval and unprecedented advances in science and technology. And it was against this backdrop that traditional forms of art now seemed inadequate. Melcher's career bridged two eras, the academic tradition when observed reality was the basis of art, and non-representational painting when the inner reality of the artist became a new goal for artistic expression. And in between those two bookends were a dozen more trends circulating, the isms as I call them, symbolism, naturalism, impressionism, and post-impressionism. Melchers formulated a style that looked backwards, but also selectively was responsive to the new, a kind of fusion between realism and impressionism, and that's a great example. But compared to Paul Cézanne, Pablo Picasso, whose careers overlapped his, Melcher seems very much a man of the late 19th century. There is no innovation in Melcher's art, certainly no radical vision. And in this respect, Gary Melcher's story is not wholly unique. There exist dozens of his peers, certainly not with, a, with the accolades of Melchers, but very accomplished Americans who made a good living by their craft and who, like Melchers, hadn't revolted entirely from tradition. A good example is Walter McEwen, another American expat and friend of Melchers. Often he painted with him in Holland. And this is McEwen's painting, All Souls Day. Uh, while artists like McEwen and Melchers have been ellipsed, eclipsed in popular memory, they nevertheless represent the rich flowering, the renaissance, in fact, of American painting around 1900. And without their story, says art historian Michael Quick, the tale of an entire generation of American artistic endeavor would be incomplete. The choices Melcher's parents made for his training may have sealed his fate. His father, Julius, a political refugee from Germany and a classically trained sculptor, agreed to send his precocious 17-year-old back to the old country for training, not to the progressive schools of Paris, that would come a little later, uh, but to uh, the Royal Academy in Dusseldorf, Germany. Dusseldorf was once a leading European Art Center, but by the time Melcher's enrolled, was regarded as a stronghold of conservative academic realism. Its reputation for old-fashioned subjects, uh, peasant painting, history painting, religious subjects, scenes of everyday life, largely shaped 
Gary Melcher is developing artistic vision, particularly in his choice of themes. And so wide-ranging his, was his subject matter that his branding can become pretty confusing, and that doesn't always serve a reputation well. Basically, it's human connections that Melcher's painted, and it's this un undercurrent in his canvases that continues to speak to people across town that's, uh, that still has relevancy, and ironically, has guaranteed the survival of his reputation. Melcher's friends rem uh, remembered him as a vivid storyteller, and you can see that here. It's the authenticity of a narrative like the choir master that reminds many of our guests of the quintessential storyteller in paint, Norman Rockwell. Melchers painted everyday people and the circuit of their lives. As his friend, the art critic C. Lewis Hines summed up, quote, his subjects are simple, the things near and known, the eternal and the banal, end quote. And it was a path from which Melchers never diverged. The last two pictures you saw were painted 30 years apart, and yet here he was, in the end of his career, still painting many of the same subjects, in this case, a master and his pupils. Gary Melchers, painted, there we go, age versus youth. This is grandfather and baby from a private collection. Loneliness and shared love, a sailor and his sweetheart from the Freer Gallery in Washington. He painted rites of passage, baptisms, weddings, even last rites. He painted the nobility of work, the value of the family circle. This is the smithy, a very important work, also in a private collection. He painted motherhood, and these are two of his favorite models from Falmouth, Virginia, Julia Payne and her infant son, Ivan. These are some of the most indelible pictures of Gary Melcher's career, and it's curious that he produced no children. And in an age when women began to assert themselves in the public sphere, he reinforced the traditional view of women whose special realm was the home. That's probably our most valuable painting at Belmont. And he cast women as the chief ornament within the home. And this is Gary's wife, uh, Corinne, at Belmont. He painted biblical stories. This is our most popular painting at Belmont, the Nativity. He painted scriptural truths restated in the most natural and unaffected terms. And he painted from both a Protestant point of view, where the scriptures held primacy. What's the subject? I heard it. It's the Supper of Emmaus, exactly. And from the Catholic point of view, like the mysteries of the sacraments, images that express profound faith, both outward and inward. This is the communicate from the Detroit Institute and St. Genevieve. Audiences often assume that Gary Melchers was a religious man, but it doesn't appear that he was ever raised within a religious framework. His father, who was caught up in the uh, the unification movement that was changing the political face of Europe in the 1840s named his eldest son Julius Garibaldi in tribute to the great Italian patriot. And as the monarchists and the church didn't side with the nationalist movement, I'm guessing that Gary's father uh, turned his back on the church. Gary Melchers was profoundly moved by the human family, and the expression he gave to it, I think, was his religious exercise. There's more topics. Other topics that brought him recognition, mural painting, a historic, historical narrative and allegory. This is his uh, painting, it's a companion painting for murals in the North Pavilion of the Library of Congress. This is war. And then there are his classical nudes, the best of them painted with an earthbound weight and a brilliant colored accents to rival Renoir. 
still life, which he took up in earnest later in his life. And pure and figurative landscape as a distinctive record of a place and its people. No American was as synonymous with paintings of Holland as was Gary Melcher's. And sometimes he engaged in a little myth-making. The dutchier he painted his scenes, accessorizing them with windmills and tulips and wooden shoes, the more attractive they were to his customers. This is in Holland, a monumental painting at Belmont. And he did the same in Virginia, where he sought to record the particular charm of American small-town life. But now he's painting church steeples and fences and laundry on the line. He captured the radiant light of the Caribbean and the dynamism of the Manhattan waterfront. He was most in demand for portraiture, and it was profitable work. Melcher's reputation was solidified with the portrait he painted of President Theodore Roosevelt, commissioned by the Detroit industrialist Charles Freer to be included in his gift to the nation, the Freer Gallery on the Mall. Painted at the White House in 1908, the President and Melchers had a powwow in his dressing room to decide the best choice of costume. Roosevelt was happy to dispense with a regulation frock coat for his riding habit, but he complained initially that Melchers had painted his face looking too round. Is that the man who sent the fleet around the world, he leveled at the artist? Melchers made some adjustments, and in the end, T.R. declared that he was pleased as punch, and it was the best portrait that was ever painted of him. And I'm so impressed with Melchers, he must have been very disciplined, because he maintained his composure and his focus, considering the parade of personalities that continue to disturb the painting sessions. Mrs. Roosevelt, Roosevelt's daughter, Alice Roosevelt Longwood, Worth. Secretary Taft, his personal secretary, Mr. Loeb, Mrs. Cabot Lodge, Ambassador Jusseron, the Duchess of Sutherland. And then there was 11-year-old Quinton who kept begging for Gary's half-empty tubes of paint so that he could paint water, watercolors, or rather butterflies at, at Gary Melcher's feet. Melcher's chief rival in the portrait business was John Singer Sargent, and he painted T.R. in uh, 1903, five years earlier. Technically, both portraits are of the highest caliber, but it's one thing to paint a good likeness and quite another to capture character, the commanding personality of a Roosevelt. Where one is introspective or even detached, the other actively engages the viewer. Roosevelt's iron grip on that finial says an awful lot, speaks volumes about the man. So, is he a portrait painter? <laughs> is he a landscape painter, a painter of the mother and child? Yes, all of the above. The multiplicity of his themes is only half what makes Melchers such a hard artist to classify. When you encounter a room full of his pictures, it can seem as if multiple painters are represented. So versatile is his style. Both of these pictures were painted by Melchers at Belmont. The approach he took could be so varied. Sometimes he dials right in, plumbing the psychological depths behind the facade of his subject. Or he might disregard personality altogether in favor of the formal properties of a composition. This was done early on when he was a student in, in Paris. While in another instance, decorative aims might have primacy. He loved to paint this cape. You see it over and over in his paintings. So he became, particularly after he married, his palette brightened, his brushwork loosened, and he really became a decorative painter. And sometimes symbolism has the upper hand, and his visual language can be both, whoops, both modern and archaic. This painting has the look of an icon, a modern holy family.
the medium of watercolor enjoyed a revival at the end of the 19th century. And it's here that Melcher seem to, seems to us very modern. He's painting in the open air so that he can record the shifting patterns of light that enliven his, page, his pages, expressing no more than his first spontaneous impressions in pure emotional color. And it's with color that he's most associated. He's considered a colorist first and foremost. And it's how he became most expressive through color. If you haven't already noticed, there are legitimate parallels that can be drawn between the artist and other artists. While some dismiss Melchers today as derivative or imitative, Melchers himself contended that the really fine things in art express themselves in much the same way in diverse individuals. To name just a few instances of a family resemblance, Melchers will always be on the left of these comparison slides. Melchers took inspiration from Mary Cassatt, her fondness for the mother and child theme, but also her deft technique. Melchers was an excellent pastel painter. He took inspiration from Monet, his gift for rendering the peculiarities of time and day, of day and season, the ephemeral nature of light and atmosphere. He adopted the work of the French modern Edouard Manet for his painting, The Fencer. And he was inspired by the penetrating psychological drama of Rembrandt. I would argue, as many of his contemporaries did, that Melcher's is an original art, that he combined the best painting of the past and the present to produce what is unique, a personal vision. As a writer remarked, quote, Melcher's never need sign a canvas, and yet you would know its parentage, end quote. He went on to say, Melchers belongs to that sturdy, positive race of observers, embodied in the motto he posted over his studio door, var and klar, Dutch for true and clear. And it's that quality that many have articulated as a robust honesty, that his hand has a distinctly American virility. And I think that Melchers was often at his best, as in this example from the Art Institute of Chicago, The Mother and Child, when he dispensed with distracting clutter in favor of clarity, that what he left unsaid is what gave his paintings emotional impact. And it's the timeless and universal appeal of the mother and child that lent itself to use on a stamp for the Republic of Rwanda in 1975 and on the cover of a recent novel. Melchers wasn't always after conventional beauty. In fact, he rarely was. He was open to the many meetings of beauty Quote, think of Rembrandt's ideal of beauty, he wrote. He found many of his models in the ghetto and among his friends and neighbors. Surely he has proved to us that only that which his character is truly beautiful, end quote. Melchers wanted his pictures of people to be the genuine article in both attitude and appearance, not idealized and sentimentalized, although sometimes I feel like by our modern standards they tend to be a little, little sentimental. For this tendency in looking for the character over beauty, he and others like him were collectively referred to as the naturalists and often were also dubbed apostles of ugliness. Criticism over his choice of models continued to be the most common complaint registered against Melchers and about this picture wedded a Midwestern critic advised that it, quote, don't cost any more to paint good-looking ones, end quote. But Melchers remained unmoved. And here's a factor that might have worked against him. To make a good living and a lasting reputation, what's needed in addition to talent and hard work is assertiveness 
and business acumen, the cultivation of social contacts, and considerable showmanship. Now, the illustrated art press had expanded considerably by 1900. And self-aggrandizers like Whistler, talk about a showman, really made effective use of the press while Melcher's did not. One writer observed, quote, Melcher suffered from two afflictions, celebrity and modesty, end quote. About himself, Melcher's was notoriously reticent, if not truculent, which confounded journalists. Melcher's asserted that his art should speak for him itself. He was pretty contemptuous at talk, really. Lewis Hines said in his defense, he's only concerned with the thing done, with the result, not the reasons. When a friend went to the trouble of setting up an interview for Melcher's, he protested and writing back said, quote, the trouble always with me is that I am a very bad subject for that sort of thing, for when pinned down to answering questions, I close up like a clam, end quote. Melcher's insisted that he certainly couldn't talk to the press about other living artists. He kept his opinions close to his chest, unless it was about that celebrated American modern Mary Cassatt or Edgar Degas or Claude Monet, all of whom he admired greatly. After persistent probing from a determined interviewer, he confessed cagely that with regard to the moderns, he thought it was important to be receptive and open to different movements, but from a distance. And then suddenly, letting his guard down, summed up the, uh, the work of Matisse and that, that class, which he probably meant Picasso, is merely speculative. He was a little wrong about that. On a side note... In the 1920s, Gary Melchers and his wife purchased Edgar Degas's fallen jockey. Mrs. Melchers left it to her younger brother Lawton, who was always hard up for tin, and he sold it in 1960 to Paul Mellon. It continues to figure in important exhibitions. It's been on the cover and exhibition catalog. It's the greatest painting our institution never had. While Melchers was modest, he was nobody's fool and defended his reputation when the situation demanded. An example of true gumption occurred. It was reported in an issue of Town and Country Magazine, 1925. Many years earlier, Melchers had been uh, honored with an entire gallery devoted to his paintings in the massive uh, Berlin International. I think it was 19, 1900. Um, when the Kaiserin was escorted through the displays, she singled out Melchers, praising his paintings, but notoriously prudish. She asked for the nudes to be removed. Her request was communicated to Melchers, who wired back, you can remove the room, but not the nudes. And the room remained. The Kaiser, too, had unenlightened tastes and famously arbitrated his will on the German art scene, rejecting the new directions in art in favor of massive propagandistic works. And I have to wonder if the Red Hussar was painted as a sort of private retaliation against the royals. Curiously, I've not found that this painting was ever publicly exhibited. I haven't exhibited the painting. <laughs> the Hussars were the Kaiser's light imperial cavalry, and they had a reputation for being reckless, hard-drinking womanizers, so that this image of the office, an officer of the Hussars deflowering this woman, note the overturned vase of flowers, begs the question. With so little to say in the way of passion or poetry, and judging by his tremendous output, what one might be tempted to think that Melchers regard as, regarded painting as a business, uh, just another way to make a living. But those who knew his habits consistently described him as being uh, an, a, a person, a creative person with an irresistible urge to paint. Lewis Hind wrote, 
Quote, life to him would be barren and tedious without his craft. Most painters have other interests. Melcher's idea of relaxation is tur to turn from painting the figure to painting the landscape, end quote. Discipline and constant effort characterize Melcher's lifelong commitment to his craft. His future mother-in-law, in writing back to family in the States, characterized him as verging on reclusive, so focused was he. Melcher himself is famously quoted as saying, nothing counts in this world with a painter but a good picture. And no matter how good a one you do, you have only to go to the galleries to see how many better ones have been done." End quote. At the École de Beaux-Arts, the state-run academy, and the private academy Julian in Paris, Melchers was remembered as a serious, hard-working student with whom it was not wise to trifle or else get your ears boxed in reward. Although here I think he's cultivating kind of a bad boy image. <laughs> Interruptions to his work, and the allurements of others were not to be born. He was known in his Dutch village as Mala Melsi, uh, funny or odd Melchers, because his mood could fluctuate between affectionate and aloof, and sometimes downright cantankerous. When traveling with his cronies, he was usually the one to quit at one whiskey. And while they might keep long hours over a game of cards, he was the, habitually the first one to bed because his work awaited him in the morning. While they went boating or golfed, Melchers might go along, but he was hard at work, and he stayed behind, to pay, or he would stay behind to paint the local scenery. Some of his practices make it look like he was a bit of a hack. On and off throughout his career, he would crib from his earlier successes. But as they often yielded equally fine iterations, you really can't find too much fault with it. I have counted, he's, he painted about 105 mother and child scenes. Melcher's had a tremendous work ethic. Well, he was paid $10,000 in 1931 for this portrait of Andrew Mellon, which is at the National Gallery today. That's $165,000 today. So you can understand why he rarely refused a commission. Maybe he should have. There are, there's a certain amount of unevenness in his late portraits. They could be a little wooden and lack the spark of life. And that probably reflected his frequent bouts with phlebitis, but also the drudgery that painting portraits can be, particularly if you have to paint somebody who's annoying. Sargent expressed it best when he defined a portrait as a picture of a person having something the matter with the mouth. <laughs> At the same time, the muse might be with Melchers, helping him to capture his subject with great sensitivity, great artistry, to produce faces that linger in the mind, as one gushing biographer put it. If a man's life is to be only measured through the company that he keeps, Melcher's life was extraordinary. His connections are fascinating uh, in their variety and worldliness. To begin with, there is his great uncle, the Cardinal Paulus Melchers. The cardinal was a real celebrity. When he was Archbishop of Cologne, he fled to Holland to, uh, to exile himself and escape being arrested for the second time for resisting the anti-Catholic legislation of the Bismarck government. Melchers claimed to have met him for the first time when he was a young student. I wish he'd left us an impression of the uncle. In his first heady days in Paris, Melchers fell in with a pretty sophisticated and creative crowd. The French romantic composer and organist Camille Saint-Saëns, already declared a national treasure, was said to be an intimate. But true to form, Melchers left no memoirs to help flesh out the influence of that friendship. And then there's the great public muralist of France, Pierre Puvi de Chauvin, influential to a whole generation of modernists. He was an important friend of, and mentor of young Melchers, and you can see his influence best in Melchers' mural style. 
Melchers was a member of the Paris Society of American Painters, and that provided him with a wide circle of fellow expatriates. On the occasion of his engagement, American expat Julius Stewart offered to walk Gary Melcher's fiance down the aisle. Heck, he said, we'll all, all your buddies will walk her down the aisle. Her father was dead and they were getting married besides in, in Europe. Um, he also said that Miss Mary Cassatt was anxious to be introduced to his young American bride when they traveled through Paris on their honeymoon. I think Melcher's and Cassatt probably got to know each other when they worked on murals at the Chicago Exposition, the World's Fair, uh, in 1893 in Chicago. But we have no correspondence or any other evidence of the friendship that existed between them. It's hard for me to reconcile Melcher's friendship with the American painter George Hitchcock, with whom he shared a studio on the dunes of North Holland for many years. On the left is a portrait of uh, George Hitchcock and his wife Henrietta, also known as Higgles, Miggles, excuse me. And next to that, to the right, a portrait painted of George by the American portrait artist J.J. Shannon. George was a notorious swellhead whose circle of friends jokingly dubbed him gorgeous. He was from a notable Rhode Island family. He was a graduate of Brown and Harvard Law School, and he gave up the law after five years of practice to become an artist. He tended to live beyond his means. He loved horses and short track racing, and the ladies, particularly his doe-eyed students, one with whom he ran away and got in the family way, poor Agnes O'Halloran of Minneapolis, Minnesota. And from then on, his wife took him back, but she was going to chaperone the female students. But it only forestalled the inevitable. George ran off with one of his British students in 1904, and the Hitchcocks divorced, and that also seems to have severed the relationship with Melchers. Melchers, on the other hand, had a squeaky clean reputation and was considered a great catch when he married at age 42 to a Baltimore lady half his age, an aspiring artist, Corinne Lawton Makel. It was one of his pictures hanging in the Pennsylvania Academy that caught her eye and which brought them together aboard a transatlantic voyage in 1902. Knowing what he did about his colleague, it's rather surprising that Melchers encouraged this unsuspecting young woman to study for a month with Hitchcock in his um, open-air summer school classes. So, circled in red is Gorgeous and Corinne, and to, on the other side is probably Gary in the newsboy cap circled in, in black. So Melcher showed up regularly to encourage her progress, but probably to protect his interests as well. Uh, it was a romance that ended in marriage the following year and only deepened with time. Through Melcher's friendship with Hitchcock, he became friendly with a notable circle of London artists, including the American J.J. Shannon. Remember, he's the one that painted the portrait of Gorgeous. Uh, Shannon is pictured here with his wife and daughter, Kitty, uh, was elected to the Royal Academy. He was a very, very popular portrait painter uh, in London. He made everybody look enchanting. And Melcher's friendship with Shannon extended to Shannon's neighbors in uh, Holland Park, Kensington, including the famous pre-Raphaelite painter on the left, Valentine Princep, which I just have to say because I think it's interesting, he's the nephew to Julia Margaret Cameron, the Victorian pioneering photographer, and Virginia Woolf. And Frank Millay is at the right. He's another American expat headquartered in the UK who also worked with Melchers at the Chicago World's Fair and who was an occasional house guest. And their friendship would be cut short when he perished on the Titanic in 1912. Chicago's art scene was the most influential in the Midwest, and Melchers forged important relationships there with real estate developer Potter Palmer on the left and his wife Bertha, uh, best known uh, for the um, Marshall Fields department store. 
they owned that. Um, the, and they also had this fabulous collection of early European, uh, early modern European painting. So if you go to the Art Institute, the best pictures are all from the Potter collection. Fast friends with whom Melchers often traveled were the brothers Charles and da James Deering, industrial executives in the family business Deering Harvester, later International Harvester. Jim on the right was a rabid collector of art and antiques and homes, one of which is the Mediterranean Revival Mansion Vizcaya in Miami, now a popular historic house museum. In 1906, Mrs. Melcher's uncle, Alexander Lawton, was president of the Telfair Academy in Savannah. Lawton induced Melcher's to act as the institution's art agent, building its collection by getting his friends to agree to cut rate prices for their pictures which Melcher's lamented made him uh, regarded as a bit of a mean dog. And remember the portrait of Gorgeous, Melcher's was able to secure that painting from Shannon for the Telfair. Over time, Melcher's enjoyed greater appreciation in Germany than in France, and it was there that he found patronage with Hugo Reisinger, a German-American exporter, and this is a painting of the, the two owned by the Metropolitan in New York. He also found patronage in the Krupps, the steel and armament manufacturing dynasty, and also with Rudolf Maas, the media giant. Uh, he acquired a pastel painting from Gary Melcher's called Winter. He was a Jewish philanthropist and had a massive art collection. And the story regarding the seizing of his publishing empire and collection by the Third Reich uh, and the efforts to make restitution to his descendants makes for a really fascinating article in the June 2018 issue of Smithsonian Magazine. Melchers was a German-American who was very well liked and made many friends at the Grand Ducal Academy of Art in Weimar, Germany, where under the patronage of the Grand Duke Wilhelm Ernst, he taught between 1909 and 1915. As the First World War escalated, with increasing numbers of teachers and students headed to the front, Melcher stayed on and really had the responsibility of keeping the school going until about early 1915, when he began to feel the sting of anti-American sentiment, not among his friends and colleagues, but certainly among the general population. And as a first-generation American, he began to long for home. Later, he wrote, when he was safely at home, what a blessing it was to be part of a country where man is free and not jailed for giving, his, giving expression to his opinions. The Melchers became friendly with the von Schirachs in those days. Mrs. von Schirach was an American born in Philadelphia, but lived in Weimar with her husband, her German husband, and two children. The couples, or really the ladies, maintained a correspondence after the Melchers' return to the States. And in the years following Melcher's death, Mrs. Melchers read with growing distaste the news of the von Schirach's son, Baldur, who was rising in prominence and would head the Nazi youth movement. He was later tried and charged as a war criminal at Nuremberg, and we have many letters and newspaper articles related to that final trial. By late 1915, Gary Melchers was stateside, and he established his commercial headquarters in New York City, and he was a very busy club man in New York. He was president of the Century Association, a member of the Players Club, the Lynx Club, uh, the Coffee House, and he, so he hobnobbed with a lot of shakers and movers, financiers, industrialists, uh, men, men of letters. Here he is in front. Uh, white-haired and bald, sitting next to his longtime friend in the beard, Robert Underwood Johnson, uh, the editor of the Century Magazine and the secretary of the American Academy of Arts and Letters. I think he was also an ambassador, a uh, very impressive individual. He was also a poet. So the social context that Melchers was making in New York with men like William K. Vanderbilt, Senator John Guggenheim, and the Hiram Walker Distillery family resulted in additional dividends 
uh, and that is in the form of portrait commissions and additional sales. Melcher's acquaintance with men and women in the arts was wide. He painted the stage actor Francis Wilson for Actors' Equity, for example. In these days, he made several tantalizing but brief references and letters to his wife that in lunching at the Algonquin Hotel, he sat next to a nice young actress by the name of Helen Hayes. And he joined Charlie Chaplin over lunch at the coffee house. Another acquaintance was Olga Samaroff, the celebrated pianist who's credited for discovering Leopold Stokowski, whom she later married. Maddeningly, Melchers gave little illumination to these connections. I'm wondering if anybody know, knows who this is. One of Melcher's best friends late in life was Charles Blair MacDonald. He's a stockbroker. I'm looking for the golfers out there. He's a stockbroker who won the first U.S. Amateur Golf Championship in 1895, founded the U.S. Golf Association, and designed some of the most important golf courses in America. Melchers painted McDonald and his caddy for the clubhouse of his uh, most famous project, the National Golf Links at Southampton, New York. It was a while before anybody truly understood who lived among them in Falmouth, Virginia. When asked by a local yokel what was his business, Melchers answered tersely, I paint. And the man warned him, you won't get much work around here, we just whitewash. <laughs> Melchers renown became evident soon enough. Neighbors began spotting themselves in his pictures reproduced in the local paper, the Washington papers, the Richmond papers. Here we see his groundsman, Mason Dillon, and his father-in-law, Alexander Gibbs, trudging across the snow on the front terrace of Belmont with a view of the Rappahannock River as it winds to the southeast. In 1922, his Virginia neighbors took notice when his friend Charles Moore, who was secretary of the Macmillan Commission, if that means anything to any of you, the development of the mall in Washington and, and the district, um, when Charles Moore escorted Vice President Calvin Coolidge to Fredericksburg at the behest of the Kenmore Association Fund Drive. Moore arranged for Coolidge and his wife to dine at Belmont on that occasion, and former Prime Minister David Lloyd George was invited to Belmont the following year. Melchers was a cosmopolitan. He loved opera and theater, he spoke four languages, and he amassed a fine art collection of his own, but he still had a down-to-earth, unaffected manner and hankered after a quiet life. He would arrive by train to Fredericksburg in the finest tailor-made clothes with stickers all over his luggage reflecting countless transatlantic crossings, and the next day he would be in a collarless shirt and work pants. He and his wife busied themselves with a hobby farm at Belmont where they planted an orchard, grew vegetables and roses, and raised dairy cattle, a few pigs, and turkeys. And you can see in the right picture he's admiring a turkey hen and her chicks. In keeping with the colonial revival movement of the day, he and his wife deliberately emphasized the storied look of their old Virginia property, they cultivated a wonderful spirit of artful living and southern hospitality. It provided the artists with a really important respite with a great retreat from the hurly-burly of New York City. In 1920, Melchers was elected president of the New Society of Artists in New York, an exhibiting organization which included luminaries such as Robert Henry, an important American modernist, Michigan painter Frederick Friesica, George Bellows, George Lux, and the sculptor Paul Manship. Paul Manship is the one who sculpted that giant golden Prometheus at the skating rink at Rockefeller Center. That might be something you, you recognize. And he also produced this bas-relief of Melchers in 1932. Melchers was appointed chairman of the Smithsonian Commission to establish a National Gallery of Art, the present-day Smithsonian American Art Museum. Did you know that he was also a trustee of the Corcoran Gallery of Art? 
and Melchers and his wife helped found the Commonwealth's flagship art museum in Richmond. One of the galleries in the new building finished in 1936 was named in Melcher's honor. As a member of the Virginia Art Commission in 1930 until his death, Melcher's advice was invalu invaluable in arranging for and the placement of busts of Virginia-born presidents in the niches of the rotunda in the state capitol surrounding Houdon's iconic statue of Washington. And Melcher's guided a restudy of the state seal and the obverse of that seal figures on the state flag. Essentially, there were many iterations of the state seal, and he was appointed to, to see that it was standardized. Melchers was a leading advocate of artists in need, often committing his own purse to the cause. He left $130,000 to the Artist Fellowship. And in return, in 1945, the, sh the fellowship instituted a Gary Melcher's Memorial Medal awarded each year to a person or organization that has materially um, furthered the interests of the profession of the fine arts. <clears throat> In my work, I try to provide a complete and balanced view of Gary Melcher's and his body of work, not to arbitrate greatness, but to foster a new appreciation for an artist who is, by any reappraisal today, certainly undervalued. That his work as a biographer wrote, quote, is proof that what was always good is good still and that painting may be very much alive without being revolutionary." End quote. Melcher's is an uncommon tale for an artist to become a classic in your own time only to slip from prominence. And I suppose I'd want it that way, to enjoy fame in life rather than never know it, and so might have Melcher's. He played an acknowledged role as one of our best in the late 19th century, serving as an index to our national art evolution. And he saw the bigger picture, that art enriches the spirit, that it gives our everyday lives meaning. For a, a civilized society to be without it is impossible. At a New York Society dinner over which he presided in 1923, he encouraged his guests to step up to support the arts, quoting Mary Cassatt, who lamented that, quote, in America, art lacks the quality of being fashionable, end quote. To which Gary added, as do I, ladies and gentlemen, I leave it to you. Thank you, Joanna, and we'll take, uh, we'll take some questions as we have time. All right. Bill? Uh, yes, you said he was very prolific. And it, he, he did a lot of paintings. So how many, you know, how many he d produced, and how long did it take him to produce one? It depends. It depended how long. If it was a very large picture, he might knock it out quickly, or it might take months. Sometimes he just kept reworking a painting, so it really depended. How many pictures? Uh, I would say about 400 easel paintings. We've, we're, I'm compiling a catalog raisonné database, and I've identified about 1,650 thereabouts works, but that's everything from thumbnail sketches to major easel paintings. Um, other artists, uh, I think Monet produced 4,000, but Melcher's was prolific. Kelly? Yeah, yeah jo Joanna, uh, I see on Belmont's webpage that uh, you have a really nice essay on how one painting was reproduced, and people are always emailing you and asking, I have a long lost Gary Melcher's. Do you do that a lot? At, at, have they been? Uh, have others been reproduced? Have any been forged? Uh, and also, have you ever found a long lost Gary Melcher's anyplace? 
yes to all of those questions. A big part of my job is to authenticate uh, paintings. And oddly enough, for an artist that's not known, why are so many people forging his art? It's because he's not well known. And they don't think there's anybody out there to catch on. So yes, there's somebody that I call the marine master um, who is, is a faker. Um, it's a fascinating subject. I, I have people who, uh, everyday people who call and say, I just saw something on eBay and I, I want to know what you think. Well, the first thing I'm going to say is don't look for art on eBay. <laughs> they're, they're not a reliable um, arbiter of taste. And um, it's amazing how many um, people buy first without asking the experts. Um, I've had to disappoint a lot of people. Um, I even have been given their paintings. They're so disgusted. Here, you keep it. Um, but it's wonderful. It's very helpful, uh, educational as um, examples of forgeries, because some of them are quite good. Sometimes I'm not entirely sure. I'm I, I, so familiar with his hand, and that's just part of connoisseurship. I've been looking at him for 36 years, so you know I'm pretty. I can tell a brushstroke that's his and not somebody else's. But um, sometimes I'm not sure. It's hard, and and you don't want to mess with somebody's livelihood if it's an art dealer coming to you, or if somebody said, "Well, this art dealer said it's good," and and then they want me to put in writing why it's not. So it it can be a little touchy. John. To what extent is the uh, collection at uh, Belmont a representative of his total work in, and how many other paintings are there all around the world? How big is the collection at Belmont? That's a good question, Charlie. Uh, Belmont is the chief repository of his works anywhere. Um, we probably have, gosh, I should know this. <laughs> We probably have 1,200, but the very best works, the cream of the crop, are not in the collection. They sold. A lot of our pictures didn't sell, and they don't see the light of day, because my job is to make sure I preserve his reputation. Um, but we have some excellent pictures, some of those that I talked about that were valued between $100,000 and $300,000. Um, but the best Pictures are in places like the Detroit Institute, his hometown, um, the Art Institute of Chicago, here in Washington, the Smithsonian American Art Museum. And it's interesting, I was just reminded, at the Detroit Institute, they had already had around 1927, 28, when Melchers was serving on their board, they already had five or six Melchers. He was a hometown boy. They had fabulous pictures by Melchers. And he couldn't make a board meeting. And so somebody in the board meeting said, well, you know, Mrs. Walker's given us more money. Let's buy another Melchers. And somebody else said, nah, we have enough. Let's buy a Whistler or this or that. And they struck it from the minutes. So when Melchers got the minutes, he had no idea. But word got to him, and so he quit the board. Do the Dutch regard him or have any regard for his work? Oh, that yes. That's, you know, he was so good at painting Dutch rustic life that, that many critics mistook him for a native Dutchman. He's very well regarded, and recently there was a wonderful traveling exhibition organized here in the States by um, the Telfair and the Pennsylvania Academy of Arts on American expats in Holland, and it was called Dutch Utopia. Um, there were probably 30 artists represented, mostly with one or two paintings. Melchers was represented with nine paintings. He's very much associated with Holland, very well loved there. And the town in which he painted, lived and painted for many years uh, is very uh, wild about his paintings. And they still talk about him and allow us to come and visit. And they spread the red carpet for us. But this paint, this exhibition that was organized in the States and traveled did make one stop in, in, at the, in Laren, Holland, at the Singer Museum. The Singer family, they were American collectors. And so that was really important that this traveling retrospective made a stop in, in Laren. 
Uh, as a painter, Gary Melchers knew that all colors come from the color black. How did that affect his relationship with Nazi Germany at that time? Well, he didn't have a relationship, first of all. He left in, in 1915 and died in 1932. His father was a, a patriot. He left Germany he, because he was forced out because the unification wasn't successful at that time when his father left in the 1840s. The 49ers, they were called, all these Germans that were coming to the States and leaving their failed effort attempt in, in Germany. So his father was a patriot, loved Lincoln. Melchers considered himself, obviously, he was American-born and was very much uh, a patriot. And all we know is what he said about his, his feelings when he was living in Germany. You know, he was very well loved by his German friends, but um, it was a difficult period, and he was heartbroken. And after the war, he and his wife traveled back uh, several times in the 1921, 22, and 23 to help their German friends because the, I think it was the recession was so horrible, and he wanted to help them financially. But I don't, he had no relationship with, with Nazi Germany. I had several questions on this. Well, I'll work my way back. First one here. We have a Melcher print in our living room. It's the hunter. And I like to sit in the rocker looking at that picture and seeing the Falmouth, the bridge that's mm -hmm. there, mm -hmm. and the water. It's kind of trying to reminisce. What was he have thought when he was doing the painting? I, I'm sorry. Was there a question there? The last thing you said? Right. I see. It is beautiful. And it was, I'll give you a little bit of information. It was, some of Melcher's pictures were sold in 1977. Many of you remember that. Because Mrs. Melcher's in her will stipulated that some pictures could be sold to build up an endowment to help run the property as memorial. And because it was important to get his paintings back on the market. Um, that painting sold for $11,000, excuse me, $22,000 in 1977. It's changed hands two more times. The last time it sold was for $300,000. It's a really fine example of American Impressionism in the South. Um, and it's, it is owned by the Greenville County Museum of Art. And Melchers, for a time, owned the Falmouth Bridge. It kind of conveyed with his property, Belmont, which he bought in 1916 for $12,000. And the bridge, the tolls, were his to have. Um, so there's a lot of reasons why he painted the bridge so many times. <laughs> Hi, Joanna. Hi, Hi, Joe. How are you? Fine. This is the author of one of the, the first book on Belmont, Gary Melcher's The Belmont Collection. Good to see you. I just want to thank you for your wonderful presentation. And I also want to mention, you know, in relationship to Melcher's reputation, last time I was up at the National Gallery, there's this painting called Penelope, which I'm sure you're familiar with that they have, I think it's on permanent exhibition now, because I've, I've seen it actually a couple times when I've been up there. I, it was in the Corcoran collection, mm -hmm. and when the Corcoran, you know, folded, I guess it went to the National Gallery collection. So that was, you know, it was up there with the, you know, the first tier of American artists. Mm -hmm. So I just yeah. thought I'd mention that. Thank goodness. And that's a problem that, that I'm so glad Melchers isn't aware, but so many, the majority of the institutions that own his paintings, they don't come out of storage. He's seen as being passe. And so we were delighted to see that not only does the National Gallery own the portrait of Mellon and um, the sisters, but also Penelope, and that it's hanging. And that's a big thing for Melchers, especially in our National Gallery. Thank you for pointing that out. I think you said that uh, the fallen jockey was one of the most important paintings you never had. 
Why is that? Mrs. Melcher's left it to her brother Lawton. She, I mean, it was amazing. Thank goodness the Melchers had no children because the estate was left pretty much intact. And it is one of the best art preserved artist homes and studios in the world because we have every component that you'd want to have in an artist home and studio. Um, but why do what, we no longer? What, was, what was so special about that painting oh. other than the fact that? <laughs> oh, that's I'm a big sorry, question. I hear it. No, no, that's all right. That's okay. She, she left it to her brother Lawton because he would always find himself in financial scrapes. And, and sure enough, he turned around and sold it in 1960 to Paul Mellon. Um, I, I could wax poetic about Edgar Degas, but it's a whole series of jockeys that he painted, and they're painted from very unusual angles, and they're painted in a very uh, abstracted way, and they have such dynamism about them. We're not talking about Kansas anymore. This is early modern painting, and, and those are really seminal paintings in the history of modern art. The way I heard it told was that Melchers did a lot to help out uh, the wife of George Hitchcock, Hitchcock after they got divorced. How many paintings did he do with her as a model? He did the, the painting I showed you of the embroideress that Miss uh, Walton purchased for $938,000. That was Henrietta. He uh, painted her in the china closet, the picture that I said was probably the most valuable in our collection. He painted her in the Delft horse, which is a picture of her painted twice, two different states, the painting, because she looked a little happier and more youthful in the first state, and then Gary, or excuse me, George ran off with Cecil J, his, his British student, and married her, and divorced Henrietta, and so the the, the tenor of the second state was um, not so happy. Um, there, are, there might be a, one or two more, but those are the three that stick out in my mind. I think we are about, oh, do we have another question? Okay, last question. Do we have a question? Any more? Kelly? Kelly. I, I guess not. So, do we or not? One more. Why did Melchers choose to live in Fredericksburg? He'd lived in various countries, Europe and so forth. <clears throat> Excuse me. Why did he settle in Fredericksburg? That's a good question. I heard it. Melchers, like a um, hundred other artists fleeing Europe in the opening years of the First World War, headed to New York. And that there's no coincidence that New York becomes the American Art Center after the, after the war. Melcher's wife was Baltimore born. She had family that she was very tight with in Savannah. So she had really strong ties to the South. Gary once told a friend, you know, Corinne's never happy unless she's surrounded by parrots and palm trees. Well, this was not as far south as he would have liked to have gone. But um, he wanted to get away from the city, particularly during the summers. And they found out about Belmont being for sale and Kenmore and a few other properties um, in the first year that they were home in 1915. And it appealed to him, and it was right on the, the train lines. And so he was home on an average once every two weeks, um, because he could go quickly between New York and um, Fredericksburg. And as a result, he became very involved in Richmond and Washington art circles as well. Well, before we say a final thank you to Joanna, uh, Doug, if you'll bring up a slide for our next uh, presentation Thursday. We'll have some intervening bad weather, but everything will be fine. So I'm told by Thursday. And uh, this is uh, uh, a lecture uh, on Dale Carnegie uh, by Stephen Watts, who was supposed to do this last year and came ill at the last minute and missed that. So he's coming back. We're going to do Dale Carnegie on Thursday. I hope you'll be with us. Now you see why I'm so proud of Joanna. Let's join in thanking her. <laughs> Thank you.